Welcome to part two of this extended episode of the AAPB's Presenting the Past podcast, in which we're offering an overview of Latino empowerment in public media. I'm Christine Becker, and my guest for the second part is Hugo Morales. Hugo Morales is the executive director and co-founder of Radio Bilingue, the leading Latino public radio network with 24 stations, more than 75 affiliates, and reaching more than half a million listeners every week. Morales co-founded Radio Bilingue in 1976, and its mission is to serve as a voice to empower Latino and other underserved communities and deliver content in areas that most impact Latinos, such as the traditional arts, healthcare, civic engagement, the environment, access to higher education, immigration, economic opportunity, and parenting education. So thank you so much for joining the Presenting the Past uh, podcast, Hugo. Well, Melissa, thank you for uh, the invitation. It's really an honor. Well, and it's an honor to have you here, and I can't wait to hear your insights about uh, Radio Bilingue and the importance of public media in the Latino community. So take us back to the beginning, the mid-1970s, and how you organized the founding of uh, Radio Bilingue, like what kind of motivations and catalysts and people came together there? Well, you know, I want to first talk about the inspiration of Radio Bilingue, how uh, it was inspired, I think, which is quite common with co-founders, I think, of other uh, Latino radio stations in the 70s. And uh, and that is that uh, I was a prune picker, a farm worker there in Sonoma County. It's the same county where KBBF uh, was also founded years later. And my inspiration was a radio show that my brother was doing. He was four years older and a local commercial station. And that he used that space on Sundays to play traditional Mexican music. And he would also use it to promote community events that he and my father and other other farm workers were using to raise funds for uh, scholarships for uh, us farm worker children to go to, to go to college and also for a funeral fund. So I then went on to Harvard College and uh, there I became a uh, volunteer programmer at WHRB, which is the uh, Harvard College station that serves the entire Boston area. And there I established the first radio show in the U.S. that was Chicano Bariqua. This is 1971. And so what happened is during that show, uh, unlike all the other undergraduates who had their own show, whether it be on folk or jazz or classical, I did not take the microphone. I gave the microphone to the community in Boston. There were no Puerto Ricans at Harvard College. So I gave the microphone to the Puerto Ricans. I think it came from my uh, heritage as a Mixteco that we tr- tried to lift everybody's voices. And then we had another hour, the same radio show called La Hora. Saturday nights was the Puerto Rican hour. La Hora, and then Sunday nights was the Mexican-American. And so I literally got the microphone and invited people from the community to come and do the radio show. So two Tejanos, uh, a man and woman, became the, essentially the host of that radio show. And they're still in Boston, by the way. So these voices gave me the idea about giving the microphone to the community. And the other is what happened is at Harvard, the radio station, you go very, very deep into any genre, whether it be Mozart. In fact, you may play Mozart for days during January, during exams. Uh, so that gave me an idea about how you can be free with radio. The challenge that I faced was that every semester I had to justify to my fellow undergraduates the value of having these radio, La Hora. So I thought, well, why don't we have our own radio station? I mean, right? And that same, same dynamic, I think, was happening in my home in Sonoma County by my fellow farm workers I had left behind. They were also frustrated not having their own station, and that's how they built KBBF. So I came to the San Joaquin Valley. I graduated from Harvard Law School in 1975. In 76, I came to the San Joaquin Valley to build Radio Bilingue. And my real job in terms of for how I maintained myself was being a faculty member, uh, a part-time lecturer at the local university, Fresno State University, in the La Raza Studies program. So during that time, I put out a flyer that anybody who wanted to help build a Latino community-based uh, radio station, please call me. Whoever came to the meeting became a board member of Radio Bilingue, Inc., 
So uh, I incorporated that organization in 1976 with the idea of having, again, like Jesus Trevino has described, having the voices, the authentic voices of our people on the air, them having the microphones, women, men, youth, we're all, by the way, the founders were all under the age of 20, uh, 26 or younger. So we were essentially youth radio, youth Latino radio. So the idea of going on the air, we chose to go on the air on July 4th, 1980. Why July 4th? We wanted to affirm our rights as U.S. citizens, as Mexican-Americans, as Americans, that we had a right to the airwaves, the right to express ourselves the First Amendment. That's why we went on the air July 4th. Uh, Let's listen to a clip related to that July 4th launch. This is a test opening for the first Radio Bilingue station. This is KSJV Fresno. This is a test and not a regular program or scheduled program. KSJV has studios in downtown Fresno and transmitter at Ashram Point near Badger, California. KSJV is owned and operated by Radio Bilingue Incorporated, a nonprofit organization based in Fresno. Radio Bilingue Incorporated holds a construction permit from the Federal Communications Commission in Washington, D.C. We just finished listening to Fiesta en Jalisco con el Mariachi Vargas de Catitlán. Acabamos de escuchar Fiesta en Jalisco con el... Mariachi Vargas de Calitlán, aquí en los estudios de KSJV, aquí en Fresno, FM 91. Esta es una nueva emisora, Radio Comunidad, una nueva parte del Valle, de la vida del Valle de San Joaquín. Y esta mañana, hasta como eso de las 10 de la mañana, estaremos celebrando el hecho de que ahora ya estamos en el aire y estaremos tocando much- música, mucha música regional de todo México. Empezamos con algo de Oaxaca, con Qué linda es Oaxaca. Luego después uh, tocamos es, también este, Gracias a la Vida con Violeta, allá de Chile. So that is what drove us to create Radio Bilingüe, to give the microphone to the people, the authentic voices of our people, whether it be farm workers or essential workers on the air, women and youth to be on the air talking about their own challenges, their own dreams, uh, highlighting their own music, sharing news and information and learning from each other and empower in that way be empowered. That's why we went on the air. When we speak of Latino um, public radio, it's like one thing, and what, yet what you're describing is so many things and so many different traditions and so many different cultures. And I wonder if you could speak to that, the notion of acting as a platform for so many different peoples, communities, and cultures. The Latino community is diverse. You have Tejanos, for example, with their own history, their own background, their own music, their own food. You have Californianos, shall we say, immigrants that are settling in California and so forth. Uh, and so what we have done at Radio Bilingue is we have built blocks of three or four hours throughout the day, throughout the week, and then go deep on the weekends also and cater to different audiences at different times of the day and play the music that this particular audience likes so, for example, on Saturdays, we at Radio Bilingue, from the beginning, highlighted the border music and the music from Texas, Tejano. Because that is an example of going deep into a community and bringing those voices and lifting that music and culture, cultura, into that. And we start the day in the morning with mariachi, which is a lively genre of music that most Mexicans, almost all Mexicans, really, really are identified with. And that's kind of a unifier and so forth. One of the things, for example, that, that has happened is we have evolved as our community has changed and evolved. For example, we began La Hora Mixteca in 1991 when so many of my fellow Mixtecos from Oaxaca settled in California and other parts of, of the United States. So now we have like a five-hour block of La Hora Mixteca done by Mixteca women, and they facilitate the conversation. Uh, And these are volunteers. 
None of them get paid. They are here for the commitment because they want to share not just their voice, but lift the voices of the fellow immigrants in fellow Mishteko and speak in their own native tongue, which is Mishteko, uh, a language we, which we want to preserve. So, uh, and then the music, of course, of chilenas and other music that are so dear to us. Uh, and Radio Bilingue has had such a, a lengthy history. I wonder if you could highlight a few moments throughout Radio Bilingue's history that stand out for you, moments you're proud of, moments you think are really important to reflect on, or, or shows that, for instance, uh, AAPB listeners could access today and listen to kind of history as it happened. So I think for me, July 4th was a big day. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a co-founder, and that is because we were able to, at least for the first time in public broadcasting, we had four hours of mariachis back-to-back with artists that were from the peasant class in Mexico or uh, were singing music from the peasant class of my indigenous class. I'm talking about Jose Alfredo Jimenez. That's really, really going deep and highlighting that heart of Mexican authentic traditional music in mariachi and sung along with the, with the music. So I think that, that was a, a, a real highlight for me. Also, another memorable event is uh, the building of a station at the border impacted by the vision of Jesus Trevino with his film that he created. And that station uh, broadcasts on both sides of the border, Uh, a million folks in Mexicali and 100,000 folks in the Imperial Valley in the U.S. Raices de Sangre is his film, and it's about organizing on both sides of the border. But what? So we are to today broadcasting on both sides of the border, and one of the things that is a real highlight for us is to be able to cover the first free election in the 20th century in the state of Mexico, and that was in 1980, I think it's 1988, where uh, a conservative won the governorship there, and we had exit polls, we, we had volunteer reporters, and we were able to uh, declare that the winner, according to our exit polls, was the conservative. And while the official uh, officials in Mexico City said otherwise. Uh, So anyway, I think our continued coverage of the environment is something that we're really uh, proud of. Our continued coverage of immigration is something that I could go on and on about different uh, moments. The uh, uh, coverage of the killings of women in Juarez at the border is something that uh, is, is very memorable. At the same time, I'm really proud of the youth training that we have had in the uh, last 20 years in our station in Salinas, where you hear the youth voices, and we actually turn over the microphone to our youth in that radio station that covers the entire uh, Salinas uh, Valley, the solid bowl of the United States, And, and the youth produce the radio shows, and they choose their own public affairs programming. Uh, these are among the things I'm really proud of. And of course, I'm really proud of the music uh, that we're able to highlight here because that cultural reclamation is so important. We had, uh, uh, in the, around 1983, we established a mariachi festival, which went on for decades, that was uh, accessible to working class families and youth. And we had a, a Tejano festival as well for a decade. So these are the some of the things that we're really, really uh, proud of. When I love talking about radio as regards borders, because radio doesn't have borders, except for the, the extent the signal fades out at a certain point, but the notion of how important border radio is and, and reaching across different communities, I think that's such a powerful, it's a really powerful metaphor. I'm also intrigued by the notion of public media and how that ties in with the notion of trying to reach all these different communities versus something like commercial radio, which is treating people like consumers. So could you talk about that notion, the, the kind of inspiration of public media as something that treats listeners as, as citizens, as people, as members of a community to be brought together with radio? Yeah, I think public media is, uh, is a real opportunity to reach the mission of right of the Public Broadcasting Act, which is to reach all Americans. So recognition of that. And I'm so fortunate that uh, we're so fortunate to have 
public broadcasting here in, in the U.S. And I think Tom Thomas and Terry Clifford have laid it out, at least for me, uh, very well when they say the public broadcasting, particularly public radio, is able to have a stream of jazz, for example, a stream of news and information, a, uh, you know, a stream of classical, and then Latino, a stream of Latino a program. And that's where we fall in. And they, they suggest that this is a, a jewel. This is an important aspect of public radio. And so we are leaders of that on the, on the uh, Spanish uh, and Latino side. And I think that's something that is so important, as well as building these stations. Uh, we, our 25th radio station, we have just acquired from uh, a, a nonprofit there on the border at, in Rio Grande City, Texas, in the Rio Grande Valley. And we also have built another one in Presidio, Texas, right on the border. We have another station in, in Silver City that covers the border. We have built another station in Crystal City, Texas, again, that covers the border on the U.S. side. So the border, I mean, and the influence of Jesus Trevino and others have really, really been about the how is it, reclamation of culture here, but also continuing to serve the border, which for us Mexican-Americans means, I mean, that's part of our heritage and part of our current reality. It's not just something of the past, but something of the current as well. So Radio Bilingue has been strategically building a border radio without borders as a way to bring that community together uh, and uh, being part of the national radio service and also transnational. We are actually broadcasting live deep into Oaxaca in Baja California among the indigenous people in uh, every Sunday, La Hora Mixteca. So you're right. I mean, radio can be and is one that brings people together and can bring people. Uh, many uh, documented that cannot cross the borders can be able, at least their voices can be heard in their homeland, like in, in Oaxaca. When I think especially now reflecting the current moment, both the pandemic and, you know, social justice movements and, and immigration right now, uh, radio really is a lifeline for so many people. And so Radio Bilingue with half a million listeners every week, that's a really incredible impact on, on so many people. Yes. I mean, when you see, for example, right now in the pandemic, among the things we're doing now is literally giving out uh, information every hour live where people can get testing and where people can get the vaccine. Uh, when the census was happening last up to last year, we played a critical role when those people that were uh, organizing to get a complete count of essential workers could not go and knock on the doors as they had planned. They resorted to Radio Bilingue being a critical vehicle to reach that. And, and then now also uh, in natural disasters, Radio Bilingue is playing a critical role with the fires, for example, providing information on the fires and, and also the recovery phase. So we've been doing that since 1983 when there was a um, earthquake uh, near Fresno uh, at that time. In addition to its importance in, in border areas, uh, Radio Bilingue has also been crucial in urban centers. So what can you tell us about Radio Bilingue's urban efforts? Yeah, in 1984, we were instrumental in co-founding a station at KUBO in Denver, a Latino station, which is still on the air. And then another uh, effort we did is 1991 is the uh, transfer of a station to the Mexican Museum in Chicago for an urban Latino uh, effort. And that station was sold about five years ago to the local public uh, radio station. And then another effort was in um, San Antonio. Again, around 1984, we were able to save the frequency. And that frequency now is, is part of Texas. It is now Texas Public Radio. So, there, and then there's always been, how would I say, the challenge of Los Angeles, which has the largest concentration of, of Latinos or Mexicans outside of Mexico City. And that has been a challenge for us. And we hope to continue to see how we can secure our frequency there in Los Angeles, because we, we have been working affirmatively now since 1980 to get a frequency there. 
Well, that seems like the inverse of the border issue of like finding spaces within a large area and sort of carving out space to be found. That's got to be a big challenge. It, it, it really is a challenge. Also, sustainability has always been a challenge for Rowdy Bilingue uh, because public broadcasting, uh, well, the public tele, public radio has depended on individual support. In our case, the people we're serving do not have much disposable income. So we have been dependent on foundations to be able to survive. And so uh, through sacrifice of our staff, uh, and then volunteers, we've been able to produce quality uh, programming, which are part of the archives and part of AAPB. And so that's what we're proud to be part of, of that effort. But I have to give credit to our team and teams in, in the history that have, have essentially worked on uh, poverty wages and subsidizing the service to be, but they believe in the mission and that's why we've been able to do it. But it's, it's been a real challenge to be able to sustain the service and also to maintain independent and also to continue to be uh, a vehicle for that conversation and bring authentic voices on the air. Well, and it's certainly really important for many people to hear what you're telling the, the, especially the story of the importance of this kind of, of network and, from that comes this kind of support, and as you say, volunteer support. And again, fundamentally, the, the notion of public media and public support is, is really crucial. So I really appreciate you sharing these stories, these memories, uh, this history and this present. Well, yeah, I think one thing that Rather Winning has shown was that people of color can manage a network and, and a meaningful service and that uh, a service directed to essential workers is viable in the United States. And I think that that's, uh, we have to uh, thank the Corporation of Public Broadcasting. Uh, we have to thank the foundations that have been supporting us throughout the years uh, because it's this mix of funding that is makes possible for those voices, authentic voices of Latinos, including our youth and women, to be on the air. So any final thoughts about the, the legacy of Radio Bilingue that you'd like to leave our listeners with? I just want to emphasize, I think, the importance of Radio Bain is independent channel controlled by people of color and uh, indigenous-led by myself as a Mixteco. I think that's, to me, and how we as Mixtecos value community, and that's part of what influences Radio Bilingue in giving back to the community, and, and public service. That's part of, we have a term in, 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 our, in Oaxaca among our people, we call it tequio which Tekio means giving back to the community. It's a total citizen experience to be able to give back. And that, to me, that's what Radio Bilingue means. But it also means that Latinos are part of that culture as well. And we, as Latinos, are proud of what we, we have been able to do in, in music and the arts, including public television, public radio, and uh, there's more to come. Thank you so much for your time, Hugo. We really appreciate your, your insights on Radio Bilingue. Well, thank you for the invitation. And I'm excited to be able to guide our listeners to the AAPB website to listen to the clips that we've talked about today, as well as whole programs that we've referred to. So you can access that via our show notes. We'll guide you to some of the specific content you heard about today. And that's accessible on the ACA Media website, aca-media.org, or the AAPB website, americanarchive.org, and the podcast link at the bottom of the website. And thank you to the listeners for being a part of this episode of Presenting the Past. I'd also like to thank sound engineer Todd Thompson at the University of Texas at Austin for his post-production work on this podcast and for composing our theme music. Thank you to Bill Kirkpatrick at the University of Winnipeg for his assistance with distributing the podcast. And thank you to Rin Marchese at the AAPB for her help with planning and organizing these podcasts. Please join us next month for another deep dive into the digital resources of the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. GBH.